as the research and development director in his last nine years with the company. At OHP, Sam's our technical services manager. He focuses on herbicides and plant growth regulators, where he evaluates and develops new and existing products for the market. And so with that, we are going to turn this over to Sam. And Sam's going to... Uh, can hear me and, and see my screen all right? So my contact information is up on the left, as Caitlin mentioned. Uh, I'm here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, her information uh, down below um, on the right as well um, is Monterey. Um, two of us uh, be happy to answer any questions on this presentation or anything else uh, for that matter. Uh, just a quick outline of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, just kind of a map of um, where we are in proximity uh, to one another. Uh, as it relates uh, to the support we uh, can provide, the OHP uh, granular pre-emergent herbicide solutions, um, the Fuerte uh, label, so the new product for California, uh, the research and the trials um, pertaining to Fuerte, kind of how we brought this um, to market, some of the tips for success um, with an herbicide program, uh, as well as a very important step of calibration. Uh, and then an invitation to kind of assist you uh, with some of the trials uh, in your own organizations. So this map I just wanted to share real quick. It uh, looks pretty spread out uh, with Caitlin uh, in Monterey in Central uh, California, myself up at the top of the Mississippi River uh, in Minneapolis, and Carlos down uh, in College Station just north of Houston. So our pre-emergent herbicides, um, all three of them can uh, control a wide range of broadleaf and grassy weeds, uh, labeled for use on a large and diverse number of ornamental crop species. Um, everything has been tested at a 1x to 4x rate uh, for crop safety, formulated on, on a specific particle called the Verge particle uh, for uniformity, min minimal dust, uh, no odor, and an ease of application. Um, this year, uh, in 2023, uh, so far we've got 32 nursery trials to date um, for crop tolerance. So outside of the, the trials uh, that we use to develop the label, we're always continuing to, to expand our knowledge about uh, different crops um, that are safe. So that's an ongoing thing. Um, minimal PPE, no covers or Coveralls or respirators are required uh, for these products. Um, and we always just say backed by science, trusted by growers. Um, excellent plant tolerance, broad spectrum efficacy, and uh, outstanding formulation. So the first product that we brought to market uh, back in 2011 was biathlon, a combination of oxyfluorophyll and uh, prodiamine, um, or goal or barricade, um, as the common names to those. Um, a broad spectrum of weed control, a uh, wide range of tolerant species. Uh, we're at 100 pounds an acre with this product. And uh, like I said in the intro, you know, we're continuing uh, to update the tolerant or the safe to treat species uh, with internal and cooperative trials. So this was our first one in 2011. Uh, the second one we introduced uh, was Fortress, uh, designed for perennials and uh, ornamental grasses. Um, the combination of two active ingredients, gallery and dimension, or exoxib and dithopyr. Uh, this is at 150 pounds an acre, uh, 76 uh, weed species listed on the label. Um, lots of tolerant species, over 150 uh, tolerant species listed on the label. Um, again, continually updating um, the species list uh, with, uh, tr with trials. And this one was launched in 2018. Which brings us to the, the new product uh, into California, uh, Fuerte, which is flumioxazin and prodiamine, a combination of two AIs found in SureGuard and Barricade. It's got 98 weeds um, listed on the label, um, as well as 176 uh, tolerant species. And again, uh, just like biathlon, we're at 100 pounds per acre, uh, always updating the uh, the the tolerant species list as with the others. Um, 
and OHP first launched this product in 2019. So it has been registered and used by uh, folks outside of California for five years. So we're really excited now to uh, launch this to be another uh, tool in your toolbox uh, for pre-emergent weed control in California. All the products um, are formulated on a verge particle. So biathlon fortis and forte are all on this same particle here uh, shown in the, in the picture. The, um, well, I can start back up if we're ready. The, uh, the verge particle, which is where uh, all these products are formulated on, uh, minimal dust, ease of application. Uh, it is round shaped. Uh, so it kind of bounces off foliage rather than um, sticks to the foliage. Uh, it doesn't have any odor. It's clean formulation and uh, improved worker safety. The Forte label um, has a wide range of use sites. Conifer Farms. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on um, the nursery and non-crop areas, as well as container and landscape ornamentals. Jake Chillick, one of our technical sales managers uh, making these applications, is wearing all the PPE that is required. So long sleeve shirt and long pants, waterproof gloves, socks and shoes. Now I always recommend safety glasses um, as well. Uh, it does have a caution signal word, uh, which is important. I'm going to go through all the, the different spots of the uh, label, uh, just cover them very briefly, um, just so everybody's aware of what's present and what can be found. I, I won't go into them uh, in detail. Um, just kind of the environmental hazard section, uh, as you'll find on all the label, um, just talks about um, not applying to surface water and you know, be, being careful of runoff and, and things like that, about it being toxic to fish. And, um, just a, a good reminder um, that environmental hazards are listed on labels and we should be aware of them uh, as we're making our applications. So agricultural use requirements um, really goes into uh, the re-entry interval. And if we do need to get in um, early entry, um, just kind of the additional PPE that's required. Uh, so coveralls uh, and chemical resistant gloves um, would be you know, added to that uh, minimal PPE requirement. Uh, the product description um, just really talks about what it is, right? So it's a granular herbicide, two selective herbicides uh, paired together, um, not registered on vegetables or um, fruit bearing crops uh, in the fruiting year. Uh, and just describes that uh, they, it is labeled for fruit bearing, but not, um, or fruit trees, et cetera, nut trees, uh, but not when they're bearing fruit or within that year. Um, this section is just about weed management, uh, resistance management, and the, the need to rotate, um, this being a, a product uh, in the group three and group 14 uh, modes of action. So, um, you know, as is a good uh, herbicide program, rotating uh, those modes of action uh, is important. Um, goes in and talks a little bit about um, weed control strategies, and, um, just really good understanding uh, of the uh, importance of rotations. So use restrictions, you know, there's a, a thing about temperature, um, don't, do not be applying uh, when anticipated temperatures of 35 degrees, no product um, applications uh, inside uh, polyhouses or greenhouses. Um, so do not apply within, uh, you know, three weeks of enclosing that type of uh, greenhouse because of the risk of uh, volatility. Uh, do not apply to bedding plants, uh, in liners, vegetables. So, you know, this is just a great part of the, the label to, to give you a lot of the, the do nots, right? So 
um, always informative and uh, necessary to, to maintain uh, legal compliance um, of the label. Uh, this is a, a one about not treating um, plants that uh, have wet foliage. So perhaps avoiding early in the morning um, when the dew point is high and we're having uh, plants that are um, still moist uh, from the dew or um, irrigation. These particles will stick uh, to, to wet foliage, as you can see here on this rose crop. Uh, both the leaves and the petals have some of the verge particles on there. We can get some burn there. So. Uh, very important to uh, apply to dry plants. Um, talking about transplant of recently transplanted liners, um, about uh, not applying to uh, Fuerte to recently transplanted liners uh, with four inches of uh, root diameter uh, until uh, after, after they've started growing, uh, just for cautionary uh, measure. Um, Applying the Fuerte prior to the weed seeds germinating. Obviously, this is a pre-emergent uh, herbicide, so uh, will not control established weeds, uh, just things that are uh, you know, beginning to pop up from seed. Um, repeat applications about three month uh, interval. Again, three weeks prior to fall cover. This is 100 pounds per acre application. Two applications can be made annually on a crop. So going into some of the specifics, um, talks about uh, being careful about where uh, water is being recycled, making sure the, the collection site from the irrigation is at the top of the pond and not at the bottom, um, for fear of causing some injury there if you're, if you're sucking off the bottom of the pond and reapplying back onto the foliage. Um, starting with clean liners and making these applications and then a very important part is, you know, watering after these things are applied to activate uh, the herbicidal layer. So starting with clean liners, making applications, uh, making the uh, the water or the irrigation after uh, with a half an inch of water to activate this product. The rates, um, we like I said, it was 100 pounds per acre, but the label does do uh, a pretty good job of breaking it down into smaller sections um, so you can really um, target the, the growing spaces and the application areas. 76 grassy and broadleaf leaf, uh, weeds listed. Uh, you'll see on here um, really all of the, the main weeds that you're targeting. Um, I don't want to read them all individually, but uh, the big ones uh, are included. and over 150 tolerant crops. So we've got trees and we've got shrubs and, and ground covers listed on this label. Uh, it does go A to Z, so it makes it pretty easy to, to hunt down um, if you're looking for a crop. And not all of the crops uh, that we have good information on are listed on this label. Um, we are continually updating this. So if there's something you're curious about, um, reach out to us. Uh, there's a good chance we have some uh, additional data uh, in our personal um, company archives that we can uh, look back on and give you some information. If not, um, you know, always recommending small trials uh, at your operations to determine the safety before moving on uh, to the entire crops. So some of the sensitive species that have been identified along the way um, are also listed on the label. So it's important to, to see this um, because it's not recommended uh, to apply to these uh, particular varieties listed here. Um, you are permitted to treat species not on the label, but it's really important that you're understanding um, the impact that these uh, herbicides may make uh, in your operation. So the recommendation is to trial plants uh, at your operations in your own growing conditions on a limited number of plants. Take a peek at um, the plants after you uh, make these applications, observe them for 30 to 60 days, um, get comfortable with it before you're making these applications. But again, they are permitted. Um, they're just um, not listed on the label or in some cases not recommended. 
So some of the cultural conditions, um, you know, prior to the applications, the, the soil surface should be uh, clean. So removing the weeds and removing any of the, the litter, um, leaf clippings, et cetera, um, prior to the herbicide application, applying the herbicide at label rate, uh, then applying that half inch of irrigation uh, or relying on rainfall within those 24 hours is best. Um, you know, some of the, the, the practices which um, may, you know, kind of disturb the soil surface will de decrease the herbicidal effectiveness after it is. So um, try not to disturb the soil uh, after uh, you make these applications. So again, apply to dry foliage only, um, 2.29 pounds per thousand square feet or that 100 pounds per acre. Um, the verge granular is rounded, so the plants um, kind of naturally slough it off the foliage. Um, but in some cases, if it does reside on the foliage after the application, uh, it can be moved with, by brushing or dragging a chain or a blower or uh, all sorts of different methods. And then uh, water in immediately, obviously, to activate it, but it also helps wash uh, any of the particles that may be on the leaves off the plant. Um, again, uh, approximately three month intervals um, that will, you know, vary uh, in terms of um, season and, and how long this will last. But the application um, allowance is 200 pounds per year uh, with Fuerte. We've broken it down um, by individual container. If you're just looking to go into a, a small amount of plants, um, the label does break this down specifically, um, so you can uh, test individual plants if you'd like. Maybe ap ap um, applied um, certain uh, weeds um, for non-cropland, um, as I talked about in the beginning, uh, growing beds, um, other areas, landscapes, um, not for cropland, but uh, for a lot of the other uh, spots underneath plants, uh, nursery beds, etc. But uh, remember, existing uh, weeds must be removed because um, it does not control uh, emerged weeds. So like everything else um, for labels, storage and disposal uh, goes into that and container handling. Uh, and then a lot of the legal ease, right? So um, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be a label without this section. So here's some of the research and the trials uh, for Fuerte, um, which got us to this. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the weed species testing, um, you know, looking for, um, you know, efficacy at label rates, common nursery weeds, both broadleaf and grasses, um, contracting out through university and private cooperators throughout the United States uh, to develop these tests. Uh, evaluation at different time periods, um, doing weed counts and dry weights of any subsequent weed growth at the end, as well as phytotoxic screening. So taking these plants and delivering X rate, which would be 100 pounds per acre, 2X, 4X, up to 400 pounds per acre, really trying to determine, you know, if an, if an error is made and an application uh, is exceeded, are we having any issues? And so these uh, tests are done very rigorously to ensure the crop safety for the end user. Uh, and again, done through a variety of university cooperators, IR4, um, done on a real diverse and uh, in common set of nursery crops. Here was a, a study done um, back by uh, Dr. Senesak at Cornell University, uh, looking at uh, Fuerte against Broadstar, Freehand, and an untreated check on some common weeds, um, bittercress, crabgrass, oxalis, eclipta, spurge, and willow herb. Um, you know, pretty important uh, weeds uh, across the United States. Um, and you can see here, excellent control. Um, generally considered 75% or so is kind of that threshold mark, and uh, Fuerte is exceeding that. Uh, in all the species tested. This next one, I'm gonna show uh, 15 um, weed species were done by the uh, Horticultural Research Institute. Um, 
Dr. Chris Marble down at the University of Florida. And he took uh, 15 container weed species in 2018 and tested against a lot of the common uh, herbicides out. So you'll see some liquids in here as well as um, different granular pre-emergence. And Fuerte uh, up over 80% is amongst the highest control across all of these uh, weed species. And some of the ones uh, within there that may be a little bit higher um, are some of the liquids, which um, typically uh, last a little bit uh, longer um, than, uh, than granulars. Uh, but Fuerte up here uh, amongst the leaders uh, in all of these. So again, uh, it, under the container ornamentals, uh, outside nursery pads, shade houses, uh, prior to overwintering and covering, all permitted uses. For newly planted containers, uh, it's really important to water these plants thoroughly prior to the applications. So you minimize uh, any channels uh, that may go down to the roots. So we, we settle the soil with the irrigation uh, to remove the, the air pockets, et cetera. Treating the plants uh, before they're spaced really improves efficiencies and minimizes waste. Uh, once a crop is spaced at one and a half spacing, 66% uh, of an application is made to the ground. So this is a really great time to do it. And then again, following this application uh, necessary to activate uh, that herbicidal layer uh, with another irrigation of a half inch of water. Uh, established plants, um, again, remove any of the weeds prior to these applications. Uh, will not uh, control the impact uh, of existing weeds. And then treatment plants are consolidated for efficiency again. So a really great time to do this is uh, before or after covering. Um, again, water the application to activate it. And then again, um, once it is on um, the soil and it has been watered in, try not to disturb that soil surface uh, for longevity. Calibration, uh, a very essential piece to successful uh, applications of herbicide. Um, calibrate frequently, you know, repetition builds consistency. Designate an application team and remain consistent with those people if possible. Um, using something like a metronome app or something to develop and maintain your walking or your speed, your pace uh, as you're making these applications for consistency. Um, go in and double check bag count. These are 100 uh, pounds uh, per acre. So we know two bags uh, per treated area of acre. So go in periodically and, and check to make sure if, if we're looking at, um, you know, all of a sudden you go through an acre and you're at four pounds, you've just applied double. Or conversely, if you, you go through and maybe we're at a bag and a half, we're under what's needed to control. So really going through and uh, just kind of putting steps within your production to make sure things are, are being done correctly. So know the square footage of the areas you're treating. Um, this is you know, 100 pounds per acre. Uh, it's wherever you're making the applications. So if it's all pot tight and you're just applying to the beds, that's the acreage. But if you're applying to pots that are spaced, uh, the edges, the walkways, you know, those are all uh, included in that acreage. So watch for hot spots, beginning and end of the rows, um, where if you're running the belly grinder, uh, sometimes you'll get that initial uh, purge of product, overlap of spray pattern, areas around sprinkler heads where you might slow down or uh, you know change your pace up. So place the calibration uh, pans in the middle of the treatment area, set the application device and, and lock it in place. Again, use a metronome or something similar to set and keep that pace uh, and then collect as you're walking. So you'll, you'll tip this collected herbicide uh, in these pans into the window. And, you know, the way you can adjust up or down is, is if you have too little, um, you got to slow down. You got to, you know, reduce your pace. You got a little bit too much, well, walk faster, right? So repeat until you're accurate and you can replicate this confidently. So we're tipping this pan back um, and it's giving us an, in a number or quantifying the application uh, in the window. So make sure you're, what you're putting down is accurate. Too much is just wasting money and is off label. 
and, and too little is even wasting more. It's it's wasting your time and the product spent, and it's not going to get the results you need. So it's always better to be a hair over than a hair under. So again, if it's not on the label, uh, some of the internal and, and cooperative testing we do to uh, improve the uh, the number of tolerant species is keep trials small, uh, test them in your own facilities under your own conditions. Um, look at uh, at these products uh, for a little while after you make to ensure that what you're doing is safe. You know, look at the tops, obviously, but also look at rooting. Um, are any of these applications causing things underneath the soil that uh, you're wanting to avoid? Always keep good records and photos. Um, the, the key is, you know, to be able to consistently do it and look back and do it again. Um, and this little tool isn't something we sell. Um, it's a spread right G, it's called. Uh, it's great for small scale trials and, and one I rely on quite a bit. And here is an, another example of uh, one of the 32 trials and counting um, that um, we're doing uh, as OHP with uh, different nursery uh, cooperators and customers across the country. Um, so please contact us if you'd like information or you'd uh, like to begin some, some trial work yourself. So Fuerte is soft on plants and strong on weeds. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin mentioned I'm technical manager uh, and I lead the product development of insecticides and fungicides. And today <clears throat> we're gonna talk about Sarisa, our new uh, insecticide. Um, and this, uh, it falls within the class of diamide insecticides. And uh, I will give you a little bit of information, extra information about uh, Sarisa and the diamide insecticides. Uh, hopefully this will be um, a, a good product for you. Uh, we're really proud because this is a, is a novel, a new, you know, a broad spectrum insecticide, but uh, relatively safe compared to other conventional products, and when I say save, is not only save to to the to to us in the workers, but also to the environment and to um, uh, non-target organisms. So we're excited about the technology uh, involved uh, in making uh, uh, this diamide insecticide. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> uh, for the rest of the half an hour. It's going to take me about half an hour. Uh, a little bit about the basics of diamide insecticides. I'm gonna mention the three currently registered insecticides that are diamide insecticides within the ornamental market, Acelepren, Mainspring, and Cerisa. I have to talk a little bit about resistance management approaches for, for diamides and in general. Uh, uh, then I'm gonna show you a little bit of, of a field efficacy of both the foliar applications of uh, Cerisa on key pests, but also I wanna uh, uh, show you some of the, uh, the preliminary experimental results of, uh, of applications uh, of Sarisa as a drench for soil dwelling life stages of the pests. Uh, uh, and we're going to spend a, a, a little bit of time talking about the compatibility work that we are doing in collaboration with universities uh, to assess uh, the, 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 the way we can use a Sarisa uh, with the biological control agents that are used uh, for releases. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to end up with a summary. So diamide uh, insecticides are, are synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, insecticides uh, like uh, many in the past. But this kind of the new, the new technology of insecticides. And they, they first were developed and launched in agriculture in the 1910s, in the 2010s, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, they've been uh, uh, continue to develop, and, and so uh, uh, we just uh, released the R version cyclinilipril in in 2019 was when we launched that product. So uh, uh, and there's other diamides to to come. So this uh, type of chemistry really uh, have have uh, come to to replace some of the new uses. Uh, and the neocotinoids, of course, uh, came after the pyrethroids and pyrethroids after the uh, organophosphate and, and carbamates and organochlorine insecticides that were the first synthetic 
broad spectrum insecticides that many of them are no longer available. So when we compare from the 1940s and 50s to the products we have today, uh, they are those that are, 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 are very much uh, uh, very active on the insect pests, but relatively safe on the rest of the environment. So this, this, this new technology, even though they're synthetic, this new technology that, that they're implementing as far as selecting the molecules that are active on the pests, but not on the beneficials or uh, natural enemies uh, is, is really important or will be important for the continued development of synthetic insecticides. The diamides are uh, synthetic analogs uh, of, uh, of insecticides that occur in nature. So they were first described in 1999. They are neurotoxic, so they impact the, the, the uh, in, uh, neural connections, uh, especially uh, at the muscular cell level. Uh, they, they, their target is the rionidine re receptor, and and uh, you know uh, very conveniently this receptor is not present in in, in higher animals and mammals, and so uh, it, it makes them uh, uh, selective on ins on insects. It is uh, derived. Uh, these uh, these molecules are, are derived or or were copied from. Uh, 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 Rhinia speciosa, a, a plant in the family Salicii, the willow family, that has these natural uh, uh, insecticide compounds and that species is native to, to the Caribbean. So the, the whole family of diamide insecticides uh, it, it's, is basically modeling nature and changing some of the characteristics of those molecules to make it more uh, effective as, uh, as control agents. Uh, how do they work? The, the diamides uh, work again in the, in the muscle cells. And uh, we have here a, a, a graph uh, showing rhinaxapir. And the rhinaxapir is the commercial uh, uh, name of chlorantranilipril, the first diamide insecticide that was first launched into the agriculture market. And so rhinaxapir uh, um, messes up the, the, uh, this uh, channel that, uh, that uh, uh, causes uncontrolled release of carbon uh, ions and this disrupts the transmission of impulses and and so uh, uh, it causes regurgitation so lack of feeding uh, general uh, you know lethargy or, or you know the insects become slow and, and paralyzed and uh, rapidly stop feeding and it causes death within 72 hours so uh, uh, the the mode of action is, is is its own so the the diamide insecticides have their own a mode of action classification, and this, those are the, the group number 28. Uh, <clears throat> just to show you how uh, safe or relatively safe these this compounds are, this graph shows the, the, the response, uh, uh, say, mortality uh, on the Y act and on the X axis, on the, and then the, 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 the rhinaxapir concentration in the X axis. And uh, we have here different lines for different uh, types of organisms that have, that have been uh, evaluated or tested. And this is part of what all the products uh, go through as far as ecotoxicology. The, the lines, uh, the blue, uh, red, and green lights, those represent insects. And so in insects, uh, um, what you see is, is that a, a little increment in the concentration of the of the molecule causes large responses, in this case, mortality uh, on, the, on the insects. The insects include, in this case, a cockroach, uh, uh, per Planeta Americana, uh, Drosophila melanogaster is a, is a fruit fly, and Heliothis resins is a caterpillar that attracts several crops. So you see in the insects is a quick response, so uh, very active on these targets uh, on insects. But if you see, the other lines, the green one, the orange one, and the pink one, you see that, that it takes a lot more, or, or even in the humans, they're not even active at the extremely high concentrations. So this indicates that diamide insecticides are very safe for, for mammals, uh, including humans. Uh, I mentioned the three products that are currently registered uh, for ornamentals, uh, and now we have Cerisa also in California. The active ingredients of, of, of Sarisa is cyclanilipril. Uh, aceliprin was the first one that was introduced. It's chlorantranilipril. 
and the mainspring is cyantran liberal. And uh, what I wanted to show here is how they are different, although they are in the same class, they are different in, in, in several ways, including uh, water solubility. And so these, the, these products, in, in, you know, Sarisa has the lowest water solubility. What that means is that it's not going to diffuse into the, into the, into the vascular tissues of the plant. It's not going to go into the nectar. It's not going to affect pollinators that way. It's going to stay on the surfaces of, of that, that you put it on, on. So that's one of the benefits uh, of uh, that makes it great, especially on chewing insects, but also on uh, uh, thrips and, and other uh, pests that feed on the s uh, uh, surface of the leaf tissues. Uh, Another cool thing about uh, cyclinilipril, and, and this is the active ingredient in Sarisa, uh, is that it's not volatile and, and it's got uh, relatively high uh, lipophilicity. So, so it can bind to, you know, if you think about insects, uh, they are surrounded by a wax layer. The plants are sur surrounded by a wax layer so it can stay on the surface of the plant uh, or uh, on the wax layer and, and it can stay also uh, uh, on the surface of the insects providing entry into the organism and, and providing some of the mortality. Uh, uh, Sarisa is a translaminar. So what that means is that if you apply it on a surface of one of the surfaces of the leaf is gonna go through and, and, and protect the, the, the leaf underside as well. One of the ways that uh, we uh, entomologists test this is by treating uh, one side of the leaf uh, uh, and, and exposing the other side of the leaf to, uh, to the pest, in this case, uh, uh, diamondback moth. And, and, and what it shows here in the pictures, the control versus the, the treated, is that in the control, which only water treated, there was no protection. But when you treat one side of the leaf with cyclinilipril, the underside of the leaf also gets uh, protected by the translaminar activity. Uh, um, is not fully systemic, it is translaminar, but it's got enough uh, uh, systemic activity to be moved into small plants uh, uh, in the event that is, the, that, that is absorbed by the roots. Uh, it is really strong on contact. Uh, uh, Sarisa is, is very active on contact, on, especially on, on caterpillars, but any of the soft-bodied insects. And one way that uh, we test this is by spraying uh, the insects uh, um, on a container and then taking them out of the container uh, to an untreated container and observing uh, the mortality levels. And what we see here in this data, uh, mortality at different concentrations, is that cyclinilipril, which is the active ingredient in Cerisa, has the higher mortality, highest mortality even at lower concentrations compared to chlorantanilipril, which would be a celeprin and other similar uh, diamide insecticides uh, in the ag market. So good contact activity, uh, fast activity as well, uh, relative to other uh, um, novel, you know, uh, uh, safe compounds, if you will. And in this, in this graph, you have the, the, the number of the mortality uh, in hours after treatment and you compare the, the red and the green light, those are diamide insecticides. Uh, the, the blue line is a so pyrethroid. So you see in the pyrethroid, half an hour before treatment, it, it's already achieved 100% mortality versus the diamides. It takes them hour and a half uh, uh, to two hours for it to work. So uh, two hours is still a, a fast, but they're not as fast as a, as a highly a toxic and broad spectrum pyrethroid insecticides. So that, again, that's one advantage of uh, the, the rapid activity is one advantage compared to other low risk pesticides that take that may take longer. Uh, but the main difference between uh, uh, Sarisa and, and other diamides is the spectrum of activity, you know? And so how we measure the spectrum of activity is by looking at uh, what concentrations, what, are, what is the concentration of the solution that will uh, cause an effect, for example, mortality in 90% in uh, of the sample population that we're testing. 
So this is the insecticidal activity, the lethal concentration value on, in parts per million of two diamides comparing Sarisa and, and Aceliprin under different, uh, for different groups of insects. So the diamides were originally uh, developed for caterpillars. So you see for Lepidoptera, uh, very similar uh, activity of uh, Aceliprin and Sarisa. But then when you start getting into other types of insects, in particular thrips, in particular the flies, and, and, and in particular the, the hemiptera, which includes white flies, uh, um, you see that the needs a uh, 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 needs a lot more. So it's, Sarisa is much more active at those concentrations against uh, a, a wider array of pests than uh, uh, than chlorantanilipril, which is in a uh, Again, I have to talk a little bit about uh, resistance because this uh, again is this is the third diamide insecticide that is going to be in the in the in the ornamental market in California, and there's others coming relatively soon. So this comes from the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, which is a, a industry governmental partnership, and they develop guidelines to, uh, to minimize or avoid uh, the selection of insecticide resistance in populations of pests that will, uh, uh, that will render those products uh, obsolete in time. So what we wanna avoid, and, and in this graph, you have those arrows in different colors representing different modes of actions. And so the, the purple, the green, the yellow, and the red arrows indicate four different uh, modes of actions indicating, for example, one of them is, is the diamides. The, regardless of the, of, of the brand of the product, if there are diamides, they, have, they share the same mode of action. So what, what you don't wanna do, uh, and, and you see the X mark there at the top, you don't wanna use the same mode of action um, generation after generation, year after year, season after season, because that's the quickest way to select for populations that are resistant. You know, uh, if you have two two products, that's that's a little better, but but uh, but not enough to completely minimize resistance. If you have two products and they're using back to back, so you can extend. You see here the difference between the the, the second row and the third row is that. Instead of changing the product uh, uh, every application, we do back to back two applications before we move on to, to the a different mode of action. So some insecticides like Sarisa have a minimum reapplication interval of seven days. So it allows you to do back to back applications to the same generation as is shown here in the third row before moving on to this to the next one and that's a better alternative than 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 using over and over the same ones back to back <clears throat> of course the the best situation is when you have more than two up, up to four different modes of actions and you can rotate rotate every every generation and every season you can rotate so it's uh for resistance management programs you need to combine or or, or include uh, diamides with other two or three different modes of action in a rotation for it to be successful in reducing the risk of resistance selection. Uh, uh, let's talk about a little bit more about Sarisa. Uh, it's it's uh, for use in ornamentals, conifers, Christmas trees, uh, uh, non-bearing fruit in commercial greenhouses, shade houses, and, and nurseries. Uh, so it's uh, uh, in, in this particular label, we 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 uh, had not uh, received the registration, but now Sarisa is also registered for some greenhouse vegetables, uh, including uh, peppers, tomatoes, and and uh, eggplants. Uh, it is for foliar spray or sprench application. Currently, we do not have a registration in the U.S. or in California. Uh, for a drench application, but uh, the foliar application uh, basically target the insects that are feeding on the foliage, uh, including uh, uh, chewing insects like the, the beetles, the flea beetles, Japanese beetles, the worms and caterpillars, but also things that feed uh, by scraping like thrips and, and some sucking insects, including uh, plant bugs and lacewings. With the drench applications, what we are targeting are the soil dwelling life stages of the pests, including thrips, uh, the larva of the grubs, uh, of the, the fungus gnat larva, uh, and, and some of the caterpillars, in, including the European pepper moth, that may, they may survive right on the surface of the soil. And uh, so the Sarisa 
uh, is a great tool for any of these uh, foliage feeding pests. Uh, the <clears throat> label, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, very little restrictions. Uh, it's got a four hour re-entry interval period. And you see it's, uh, it's, it's divided in two, the, the high and the low rate for the, uh, the low rate between 11 and 16 and a half fluid ounces. Uh, it's very active on, on the caterpillars. So when you are targeting caterpillars alone, it provides a very cost-effective uh, tool for controlling caterpillars. When you're targeting uh, other insects, including uh, uh, the foliage feeling be uh, beetles, the, the, the white flies, the, the, the leaf miners, the lace bugs, then you need to use the higher rates, especially for those leaf feeding beetles like flea beetles. You want to use the highest rate because that higher rate also provides uh, repellency uh, at those rates. So you want to not only kill the insect, but you want to prevent uh, feeding damage. Then you go with the, with the highest uh, uh, rate. But it also provides the ability for the grower to, to change the concentration based on how much water per area uh, we are using or you're using. If you're using a, about 100 gallons per acre, it, it almost doesn't matter. But if you're using less than 100 gallons or more than 100 gallons, you can change the concentration and make it work in a per acre basis so that uh, you achieve the best coverage possible and you don't need to uh, uh, um, overspend in, in highly concentrated when you're using high volumes. As far as efficacy uh, uh, in 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 uh, control experiments, this is this is original work you know that we've done with, before we registered the product, and this is work by uh, Dr. Ray Cloyd in Kansas State University. Uh, uh, this is on Gerbera daisies and on Western flower thrips, and he looked at the mortality by Sarisa and Mainspring at two rates uh, uh, at six days after treatment. And so in this case, Sarisa provided higher mortality. In this case, the higher, the better uh, relative to mainspring at two rates. And, uh, um, and I, I think this is because of this contact activity uh, and, uh, and this uh, low solubility that makes it uh, effective product against the Western flower thrips. I can't say that Sarisa is better than mainspring in, in, in all crops, but in Western flower thrips, it seems like we're, heading, we're having uh, better luck with that pest. I've, I've done some research in white flies, and, and mainspring seem to be a little better than Cerisa on white flies by itself, especially at the lower rates the mainspring can be used. So depending on on the insect, the 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 the, the insecticide that may be best for it uh, uh, may be different, uh, even within the same family. Just just as it happened when we used to work with neonicotinoids, every, every compound was better for a particular use, and, and that's just what is happening in diamides as well. The more that we learn about them, the more we understand which are the better attributes. Uh, for uh, 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 flea beetle control, uh, this is an experiment that is, 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 is done a while ago, but this is part of the IR4 program when, when we're, we were developing uh, uh, Sarisa and, 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 and other insecticide we have. And what you see here is, is very high mortality of, uh, uh, of Sarisa at 22 and 27 ounces. Uh, compared to some of the best other alternatives. Uh, um, and so uh, this is one great tool to prevent damage by leaf feeding beetles, including the redheaded flea beetle. Uh, uh, this is the same author, by, but different, uh, um, different experiment. And there they were comparing the control of the redheaded flea beetle on, on hydrangeas. Uh, uh, and uh, you see different treatments here on the left, including one IKI 3106, which was later named Sarisa, providing 100% control at the end of the trial, similar to that of a neonicotinoid TriStar. And so, when when you when we have a product that is that is lead, you know that's causing similar uh, mortality levels to neonicotinoids, we have a, a, a great uh, tool, we think. Uh, European pepper moth, uh, I mentioned, uh, is one that survives in the soil uh, or, or in the surface of the soil and feeds on the foliage that is hanging. Uh, it causes a tremendous aesthetic damage. 
and both uh, uh, Sarisa, uh, you know, and Pradia, which is a, a combination product that is not still registered in, in California, but Sarisa itself provided great control of the European pepper moth. Uh, in, in the case of uh, containers for Japanese beetle, uh, you, we, we have here a Tennessee State University work uh, trying the, the, the application of, of Sarisa uh, as the, they do the quarantine treatments for Japanese beetle uh, uh, eradication program and, and, and uh, movement authorization. And, and as we see here, um, Sarisa provided great control on, on three and 15 gallon pots uh, relative to, to the, to, to the uh, a standard commercial standard they were, they were using. So great control of live Japanese beetle larva. Now the end of the presentation, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the compatibility uh, uh, of, uh, of Sarisa on, on beneficial insects, including uh, natural enemies that are, that are used in biological control programs. And, and this is work that, that has been with the help of, of universities, including Ohio State University. So I, I just had the, the chance to, to talk about this work in a recent uh, meeting uh, of the uh, North Central and Southwestern branches of the Entomological Society of America. So I'll summarize you there, but uh, basically we have done work uh, to compare the, uh, the direct and indirect effect of applications of Sarisa and other diamides uh, for the natural enemies. In the case of the predatory mites, uh, uh, because Sarisa is not a miticide, uh, it doesn't control mites, it doesn't control two spotted spider mites or any of the mites, then is very compatible with predatory mites. And the predatory mites, for example, like Amblyseus cucumeris and Amblyseus suwerski are used for the control of, uh, of, of the Western flower thrips and other insect pests. And so if you have a, 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 a selective chemical that kills the thrips, but it does not kill the natural enemy, the biological control agents, then, then you have a, a way to integrate those and use them in, in tandem. So, in, uh, uh, do, do, first of all, do they work? And many of you may have already experience with predatory mites and, and uh, managing uh, releases of biological control agents. But this is work by Stephen Orthers now with BioB when he was at the University of Florida, just showing uh, the, the difference in this case in, uh, in the control of chili thrips, uh, uh, you know, between uh, Neocelos cocomeris and Ambiseos suwerski. So the, 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 the different uh, uh, natural enemies, the different biological control agents may act differently in different crops and have different pests. So it's important to get it properly identified. But yes, biological control can work in, 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 mo in a lot of situations, especially when we use predatory mites because uh, they're, they're very adaptable and very easy to use compared to other uh, 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 biological control agents. So what uh, what the Luis Cañas uh, at Ohio State University and, and his lab did was to, to apply directly uh, uh, different in, uh, treatments, including Sarisa, uh, Pradia, and Mainspring. And I, and, I'm, uh, and I mentioned Pradia here in California, although it's not registered. Pradia is a combination product that contains the same active ingredient as Sarisa, but it also contains the active ingredient in aria, which is another selective compound. So uh, we wanted to, to see what direct mortality, and as you see, uh, uh, com compared to the, the, the water or the untreated, uh, uh, is, is really not a miticide. It's not controlling, significantly reducing the population when they are directly hit by the spray. Now, what happens when you treat the plant uh, and then you, you, you release the, the natural enemies, and that's the indirect way, right? Uh, you're, the, the natural enemy is not directly touching the insecticide but is, uh, or the spray, but is, is, is uh, being released into a crop that has uh, the, the pest already. And what you see here, you know, comparing again, Sarisa, Aria, Pradia, and Mainspring is that, that uh, very little impact on the on the survival uh, of, of the both the Amblyseos cucumeris and Amblyseos suwerski, which indicates that these products, uh, these uh, natural enemies are compatible with uh, the use of Sarisa. So it's, again, it's novel technology. It, it, the, these new uh, insecticides are providing great control, great activity against pest insects, 
but not necessarily uh, a, a detriment to the to the beneficial insects or the pollinators. So, so we we believe Sarvisa is, is a great tool because of that. Now, is uh, depending on the on, on the biology of the pair of the natural enemies, the, the the results may be different. For example, in the case of uh, of parasitoids that are released, for example, for the control of white flies or for the control of aphids, the the these are insects that that are living within the insect pest. So the potential for impact is is larger. And so uh, um, you see here the the results that we had uh, on the direct uh, effect of the sprays onto the natural enemies. And so you see here in Cartier Formosa wasn't as uh, affected by Aphidios colimani was, was uh, affected. And please note that it's not down to zero. It's not that these insecticides are, are, are killing the whole population, but it does have a stronger impact than you would expect with the predatory mites, which are because they're not insects. These parasitoids are insects, so you would expect that insecticide to be uh, somewhat more uh, uh, detrimental, if you will. But again, it's not 100% and it's not all the time. So when you apply plants, you treat plants with these diamides, including Sarvisa, uh, um, you expect that with time, that toxicity uh, is, is going to be reduced. And again, none of these diamides uh, are reducing the population of natural enemies down to zero. So again, if you are reducing the pest population, uh, uh, even if you lose some of the natural enemies, you, you are gaining uh, uh, on both sides because you, you, you're getting still the activity of some of the natural enemies while you have the reduction in, in survival by the insecticide. And so for the compatibility part, uh, we, we, you know, we think Sarisa and Mainspring have different effects on, on predatory mites than on parasitoid wasps. So that needs to be taken into account for making decisions. What I recommend is that if you're going to use uh, parasitoids is to wait seven days after uh, a, a treatment. And, and, and so that, that direct mortality is not going to influence that release. Uh, of course, with the predatory mites, we, we saw higher compatibility than with, with the parasitoids. But these effects on the parasitoids were transient, you know, so from week to week, they, they, they become uh, less uh, impact. And, and so we think that diamond insecticides can be successfully integrated into biological control-based uh, insect pest management programs. Uh, uh, the summary, uh, again, to, to wrap it up, Sarisa is a, is a new to California selective uh, diamond insecticide for the control of thrips, worms, caterpillars, beetles, white flies, lacewings, and leaf hoppers. Uh, it may be applied uh, at, at either the low rate of 12 to 16 uh, ounces, uh, fluid ounces per 100 gallons or per acre for the control of worms and caterpillars, or at the higher rate of 16 and a half to 25 fluid ounces per 100 or per acre for the control of leaf feeding beetles, including flea beetles, Japanese beetles, but also white fly and thrips, which can be very damaging. The addition of a spreader type surfactant is always recommended with the with the use of Sarisa. Again, it's got very low water solubility, so so you want it to to uniformly cover, and you want it to dissolve really well on the application tank. Uh, again, it may be used in back to back applications, seven to fourteen days apart. And, and again, for resistance management purposes, uh, if you're able to do back to back uh, applications of the same active ingredient. You know, within, this, within the same generation of the insect, then you're gaining a step and, and you can spread out, you can uh, uh, make that rotation last a little longer so you don't have to repeat applications of the same product over and over again. Uh, key features of, uh, of Sarisa is this quick knockdown activity, but also long lasting ingestion activity uh, 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 and it's safety on, on the pollinators and other non-target organisms. So it's got a four-hour re-entry interval. Uh, you know, basically, as soon as that uh, spray is dried, it's no longer being, uh, you know, the natural enemies and pollinators are not being affected. It is outstanding activity on 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 thrips, especially Western flower thrips, but also these new thrips uh, that, that that we're finding in in Florida. Uh, they've already started working on on chemical control of that, and Cerisa provides a great protection against damage of that uh, harvest pinus uh, thrips. 
Um, again, Sarisa is compatible with uh, several biological control agents, and we think this is a, a very uh, cost-effective tool for indoor and outdoor uh, applications against key insect pests. And, and uh, I think that's all I have. And so thank you very much again for your attention. Uh, thank you for your support of OHB. And uh, hopefully you'll you'll have great success for with the new products, both uh, Sarisa and uh, Fuerte. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Um, so now we have some time for Q and A. Go ahead and type your questions in the chat. The chat you should see down below. Um, there's already a few there. So we have a question from Jan. Jan's asking, do you have a chart comparing Cerisa and Mainspring for insect control? No, we, 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 have, we haven't developed that. Uh, but if you have specific questions on an insect, uh, uh, I, I, can, I can give you that information. Basically, <clears throat> uh, the Cerisa, because of its water solubility, is, is more effective on chewing insects than a more water soluble product like Mainspring. Mainspring would be uh, a little better than, than, uh, than Cerisa on sucking insects, including aphids and white fly. Uh, otherwise, for the other, for the other insects, uh, they're, they're, they're very similar. Uh, and so, uh, again, we don't have a chart, but if you have specific questions about a, an insect, uh, we certainly can provide you with that information. We have a message from Jose asking, how is Cerisa's diamide different than the other two products with diamide? Yeah, the, the diamide is, is, is a name that encompasses the, 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 the different chemistry, the, the new mode of action. And within the diamide family, there are several molecules, uh, just like we have within the pyrethroids, we have different types of pyrethroids. Within the neonicotinoids, we have different types of neonicotinoids within the diamides they're different so the main difference in the in the diamides is their chemical structure and their physical chemical characteristics and, and those different uh, uh you know uh shape the biological activity of these molecules so depending on on the on the structure and the and the chemistry like water solubility like lipophilicity uh, and and other characteristics uh those products uh, end up uh, working better against some insects than others. So the, the difference in the diamides is the chemistry and the biological activity. Okay, we have another question from Jan. Does Cerisa work fast enough against thrips to prevent TOPSP virus infection? Yeah, it, it, it depends. You know, obviously, we have to make sure that the, that the crop is, uh, is registered for, for that particular insecticide. Uh, uh, what, I, what I can tell you is that the, at the high rate, uh, Sarisa can provide repellency activity. So uh, uh, if that's just as important as, as controlling them for, for uh, vectors of plant disease, but because what you don't want is that insect to start feeding on the plant. You're not as concerned of how quickly uh, it will kill the insects as you are concerned that it doesn't feed on that plant so that it doesn't transmit the pathogen. So uh, uh, there are quicker killing uh, uh, insecticides than Cerisa, but the effect on, on, on preventing the feeding by the insect uh, is outstanding. Uh, so. I don't think we have specific data on, on that virus, but that would be my proposal that it, it, it should work because of that repellency, avoiding the initial feeding and transmission of the virus. Anything else? Okay, we'll wait for a minute just in case somebody else has other questions. Great questions, by the way. Uh, but I have to add some of that to my presentations, make sure I cover it next time. 